So the democratic peace theory connects with a number of themes that we've been talking about over the course of this, this class, um, one of which is the, the Kantian tripod of um, sort of big changes in the international system that Immanuel Kant was pointing to in the 19th century that, that he argued would, would cause the international system to trend toward greater peacefulness. It also connects with the unsteady march of freedom and that, that trajectory of the international system toward greater democratization that we've seen over the last um, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. I'd like to talk a little bit about this idea of democratic peace theory, and then we can talk about some of the reasons for why we think this uh, operates as well as maybe some of the limitations with the theory. So when political scientists talk about the democratic peace theory, we're really just talking about a, a phenomenon that we've observed, an, an empirical phenomenon. Some people would even say it's the closest thing we have to an empirical law in all of the social sciences. It's just the simple observation that no two democracies have ever, ever, <laughs> gone to war with each other, um, at least in terms of how political scientists measure war, which is oftentimes um, 10,000 uh, battle deaths um, over a fairly short period of time. So we're ruling out sort of, you know, one-off skirmishes at, at a border, we're ruling out covert operations, we're ruling out sanctions or other kinds of coercive um, action in the international system, blockades. Um, thousand battle deaths gets you on our list of wars. Um, and then the other, uh, criteria is, uh, it relates to how we measure democracy, uh, which typically is free and fair elections, um, and to be able to sustain that for uh, a period of about 10 years. Um, that 10 year threshold ends up being really important for our empirical law, because I think India and Pakistan fought the Cargill War in 1999, when Pakistan had been a democracy for about nine years and eight months. So it was it was really close um, for that particular example. Um, but by and large, the, the, the pattern holds that democracies just don't seem to fight wars with each other. Now that might suggest to you that democracies are somehow more peaceful. Um, that's not what democratic peace typically argues. In fact, we've, we've tried to test that, we, we've looked at that. And what we have found is that democracies are just as war prone um, as other types of states, as, as authoritarian regimes, as monarchies, right? Democracies fight wars with, the, with a similar frequency. They just don't fight wars with other democracies, which means they're fighting their wars with authoritarian regimes. Um, and so I think it's worth maybe unpacking a little bit why we think this pattern holds. And it's, it's hotly debated. There are some folks who say, and this is really just a statistical fluke. It's a function of democracies being relatively rare for a number of years, um, and then and war also being relatively rare, uh, along with the fact that during the Cold War, um, democracies tended to align together, um, and that maybe there's nothing behind this other than just the, the fluke of how history played itself out. But folks who argue that maybe democratic peace really does have something behind it tend to organize their arguments in terms of either um, norms or in terms of institutions. And so when we're talking about norms, we're talking about something about how democracies operate, um, shaping the beliefs of, of democratic leaders and the beliefs of democratic societies in a way that leads them to resolve their differences without compromise. And I think this, uh, I think it's, it's useful to kind of talk this through, right? So if you are a president of a democracy or a prime minister, Typically, you have had a long career in public life. Um, maybe you've served in a legislature or a city council. Um, you've had lots and lots of experiences where you've had to negotiate and deal with people you disagree with. Um, you've had to work through those problems. You've had to find compromises. You've had to accept that you're not gonna get everything that you want. And you get, you get used to the, the idea that politics and problem solving in politics involves compromise and working with your adversaries. Dictators rarely get that kind of training, that kind of conflict resolution, um, that set of conflict resolution norms. Dictators tend to solve problems by killing off their adversaries. Um, they tend to solve their problems by proactively um, targeting those who might threaten them. And they don't typically um, react well um, to to challenges. Um, that, that's 
part of the nature of being a dictator. And so one of the things that we think happens is that when democracies are um, operating the international system and they encounter problems with other democracies, they immediately go into the mode of problem solving that makes the most sense, which is we sit down, we negotiate, we compromise, we work it out, we figure out a, a solution that neither of us are really happy with, but resolves the problem without violence. Um, when democracies uh, encounter problems with dictatorships, democracies go into that mode of, okay, we'll sit down, we'll negotiate, we'll compromise, and dictators uh, look at that and see weakness and just roll right over it, um, or potentially press their advantage with military force. And this sort of, you know, startles democracies who think, you know, this isn't the way that, that you're supposed to resolve problems. And it creates that that pattern where we see democracies not fighting, but we see this this elevated tension between democracies and authoritarian regimes. So that's, that's one story that we can tell about why we think democracies um, don't fight with other democracies, but do fight with authoritarian regimes. The other story relates to this idea of institutions. It's something about democracies and about the need to, um, to operate through democratic mechanisms makes warfare operate a little bit differently. And so if you are a democracy and you want to start a war, you probably need to build a broad uh, coalition um, to win public support. You need to sway you know, Congress who has to pay for it or maybe to make the declaration of war. That the, the nature of checks and balances means that you, you have to do a lot of groundwork in terms of getting the public on board. Um, and all of that is observable, right? So you have leaders out who are banging the drum on Sunday talk shows or who are writing edit letters to the editor or editorials in newspapers. You have, um, you know, presidents making speeches trying to sway the, the population with the bully pulpit. Um, in the lead up to the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, all of that was happening, right? You can say what you want about that invasion, but there's no reason to think that Saddam Hussein wouldn't have known that the United States was mobilizing itself for that invasion. It was obvious to everybody. By contrast, when you look at Russia's invasion of Ukraine, they spent um, months uh, staging forces on the border with Ukraine um, while denying that there was any you know, plans for invasion or at least staying silent on it. And there was no sort of broader public mobilization effort until after the invasion had been launched, in which case the uh, Putin administration tried to come up with some, you know, ex post facto justification for what it was doing. Um, that difference um, between, you know, launching an invasion secretly versus uh, trying to you know, beat the drum to, to mobilize public opinion is rooted deeply in, in the institutions of democracy, of, of what it takes to be able to wield power uh, um, and, and the necessity of bringing the public along. So I think that's one argument you can make. Uh, and that ties into this idea of checks and balances, it ties into the idea of, of um, transparency. Um, but I think there's, there's another argument that people oftentimes make, and that's that leaders in democracies are oftentimes held accountable um, by the public and, and they'll be punished if they uh, if, if war goes badly. And I, I, I personally find that argument to, to collapse upon even the, the slightest of scrutiny. Um, we have lots of evidence that democracies tend to do better in terms of foreign policy decision making. They tend to hope to be more, more likely to win the wars that they fight. They tend to be more selective in, in choosing their, their conflicts. Um, they tend to fight in a way that minimizes um, their own casualties. So there's lots of things to be said about democracies and, and the conduct of foreign policy. But the idea that leaders of democracies are thinking, if I start this war and this war goes badly, you know, I'm toast. I, I just don't see it. Um, the U.S. invasion of Iraq was um, far from a success. The U.S. Um, invasion of Afghanistan after um, September 11th it turned into uh, a quagmire. Uh, President George Bush served two terms and then retired to painting at his ranch. Um, that's not a bad outcome. Um, he gets to build a library. Uh, when dictators get ousted from power um, because the war goes badly, they get killed. Um, and so dictators should be <laughs> um, very keen um, on choosing wars that they think um, will go well for them. Um, maybe be, be more conscientious about that than we, we potentially see in democracy. So this is my, my sort of side rant about why I don't actually buy that argument, but it fits within the institution's argument and, and people do make it. Okay, so I'm gonna pivot from there to um, that 
one of the caveats that I had thrown out there about what it means about you know ten, uh, being a democracy, that you have to be a, a mature democracy, you have to have, have had elections and, and civil rights and civil liberties for a period of 10 years. And this ends up being really important because when we look at the historical record, one of the things that we find is that new democracies tend to be the most war prone of all states in the international system. That's true. More war prone than dictatorships, more war, war prone than mature democracies. Um, and so there's been a lot of sort of investigation about why that is. And, and so um, folks have argued that maybe it's because in, in new democracies, leaders are, are, are scrounging about trying to find any way to sort of bring the public on board. There aren't well-established parties. Uh, people don't have a, a long history of sort of supporting one party versus another. And so leaders are doing anything they can to kind of draw people to them. And one of those could be, you know, trying to create a rally around the flag effect by, by initiating a crisis, starting a war, trying to rely upon nationalism to, to bring people um, to them politically. Um, it might also be that new democracies are very unstable and their leaders are worried about the military possibly um, intervening and there being a coup. And so you buy off the military and you buy them off with lots of tanks and guns and bombs and promotions and possibly a war here and there. Um, or it might be that new democracies just are, are look chaotic politically, uh, they appear weak, and maybe it's not that they're initiating the conflicts, uh, it's that their neighbors are looking at, at new democracies and saying these are, are potentially um, vulnerable states and we, we can attack them potentially with, with great success. And so it might be that new democracies get picked on. Um, or it could be all of those, right? It, explanations don't have to be you know either or. Um, what I will flag is that as we've dug into the historical record over the years, um, it seems like this phenomenon of new democracies being particularly dangerous really is a function of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the reshuffling of borders after World War I, uh, that a number of those states that emerged as democracies also had territorial disputes with their neighbors, borders that they disagreed with. And so it's, it's a little bit difficult to disentangle. Is it because you were a new democracy or because we had just drawn the borders of these new states and got them wrong or got them in, in ways that were contested? So I'm not 100% sure that that's true, but it's certainly a carve out that we have in, in our discussion of democratic peace. Uh, what I will say, however, is that new democracies tend to be very unstable internally as well, right? It's not just that they're more war, war prone externally, there's an increased risk of coups, there's an increased risk of civil, civil wars, and that new democracies breaking apart can, can have all sorts of spillover effects um, that can affect neighboring countries as well. And so when we're thinking about this idea of, of democratic peace, one might argue that uh, the spread and the march of democracy throughout the international system would be a good thing for international peace and stability. And it might be over the long term, certainly that, that Kantian argument that the rise of republics, the rise of democracies will trend the international system in the direction of, of, of peace seems to hold statistically. Um, but what we know about that transition process and what we know about the behavior, or we think we know about the behavior of democracies in that sort of initial transition period uh, suggests that we might see things get worse before they get better um, under the logic of democratic peace.